Thank you for joining us today for LPA's ongoing webinar series. My name is Betty Wall and I'm the Vice President of Marketing and Strategy here at LPA. And I'm very pleased to kick off a joint webinar with LPA and Pitney Bowes today to introduce our topic, which is called Avoid Catastrophe, Harness the Power of Location-Based Predictive Risk Management. I'd like to spend a few minutes describing LPA and some of the emerging trends in analytics and in the insurance industry, and then we will introduce our topic. LPA Software Solutions is a firm founded in 2001, headquartered in Rochester, New York, with approximately 40 consultants and sales locations across the United States. With 400 clients, we're focused 100% on topics of business intelligence, location intelligence, predictive analytics, cognitive, and big data. LPA stands for leveraging the power of analytics, and our goal is to assist our clients with the successful adoption of analytics through advising, implementation, training, and software installation. Our consultants have an average of over 10 years of experience and are 100% certified in their specialized disciplines, bringing thought leadership to many industries. So what this means for you is less risk, faster benefits, greater insights, and better time to value for your business. As a Pitney Bowes business partner, LPA has deep understanding of the Pitney Bowes solutions and data sets, which provide unique and enhanced insight into our own analytics and BI client offerings. We offer best-in-class solutions, and data is truly the world's new natural resource. And that data is mostly untapped. So by adding cognitive computing and natural language capabilities, you can ask meaningful, common sense types of questions and also mine your data without a hypo hypothesis. Seeking non-biased insights and non-intuitive insights is an important part of this emerging field of analytics. So today we will focus on insurance. However, LP LPA's expertise is cross-industry in retail, advertising, media, finance, healthcare, hospitality, manufacturing, distribution, government, energy, and many others. Oftentimes, competitive advantage comes from the learning in another industry and from a non-traditional competitor. LPA's educational webinars, such as the one today, have garnered over 100,000 YouTube hits, helping our clients learn more about the field of analytics. Our clients range from Fortune 100 enterprise clients to one-person companies who are looking to bring that terrific new product out to the market. Our clients are working in many locations across this roadmap, embarking on unique paths of their own analytics journey. And LPA is helping analytics leaders and C-suite executives incorporate analytics into their business strategy for efficiency and for a competitive advantage. Oftentimes, this will include software upgrades, health checks, strategy roadmaps, all aligned with your business goals. 80% of our clients are repeat customers, and LPA works to continue offering thought leadership to help our clients stay ahead of the curve. So what's new with insurance companies in the field of analytics? Predictive analytics is bringing fascinating new insights and conclusions to insurance companies today, providing much deeper information and new perspectives, and supplementing what has been learned in the past from more traditional analytics using structured data. The goal is to enhance insight with new external data sets to determine effective actions from current conditions and future events. Applying predictive analytics to the combination of precision location data, customer information, and high-value external data sources will provide a single view of your customer and also a single view of your underwriting risk. The cost of not seeing trends which are emerging and the cost of not knowing which of your clients carry the most risk can be an enormous burden to a business or an enterprise. Competition very often comes from left field, from non-traditional players. We've all read about Uber and Airbnb as new and non-traditional market entrants, where the root of their success started with seeing a problem from a whole new perspective and then leveraging data in a new way. The amount of data in the world is doubling every 12 to 18 months, and the computer systems of the past were not equipped to handle this much data. Companies who leverage this data and turn it into information will leapfrog the competition many times. 
Unstructured data from call center notes, case notes, and customer phone calls can offer new insight beyond what traditional analytics offered. And when you combine this with location and zip code information and then add the effects of historical weather, for example, the observations may be non-intuitive and often unexpected. So those are the nuggets of gold in your data. Global companies know that consumers have different buying behaviors across the globe, and unlocking those insights means big business for our clients. The largest inhibitors to using predictive analytics in the insurance industry are lack of expertise, lack of access to reliable data, and also the complexities around data integration. In our webinar today, we will address these areas and suggest ways to move ahead with success. During today's webinar, please feel free to ask questions through the chat window on your screen. I hope you will join us for future webinars by going to the LPA.com homepage and clicking on webinars or going to the Pitney Bowes homepage and clicking on events and webinars. And now I would like to transition to our presenter, Mike Hofert, strategic consultant with Pitney Bowes. Mike will cover today's featured topic and be followed by Liz Fisk from LPA. All right, thank you and hello everyone. Uh, today I'm gonna to start with just a brief overview of Pitney Bowes to give you a little background on our perspective uh, into an analytics uh, and specifically into the insurance market. Uh, Pitney Bowes is almost a century old. I believe we actually celebrated our 98th anniversary last month, in fact. And throughout that entire time, our mission has been to help our clients uh, to succeed in the world of global commerce. We do that through a number of lines of businesses. So the bottom three there are our traditional core businesses of mailing and shipping, and more recently assisting our uh, customers in the world of global e-commerce. And the top three are our software solutions where we help our clients identify, locate, and communicate with their customers. Identifying a customer may seem simple, but in a world of multiple disparate systems like CRMs and general ledgers and even old mainframe systems, it can in fact be very difficult to combine all of that information together into a single comprehensive view of a customer so that an organization can understand the full breadth and depth of their relationship with that individual or household. Once we help identify customers, we help our clients also locate them. And this is useful in and of itself to understand uh, that location information, but also to help enrich that customer record, that customer view with location-based information uh, like demographics for marketing or in the case of insurance with the perils that that customer is likely to encounter. And then we use that enriched single view of the customer to help our clients communicate uh, with their customers using the most effective message and channel and timing that will really resonate uh, with those individuals. Today, I'm gonna to focus specifically on our locate uh, capabilities and of course, even more specifically on how those apply to the insurance market. So let's take a look at an example. Uh, this picture is of a building in New York City, 432 Park Avenue. It opened last year and it has the distinction of being the tallest residential building in the world. It's also one of the most expensive residential buildings in the world. Uh, the first apartment that sold in this building was $18.1 million. The reason this is relevant for our conversation today is that when you look at this photograph where it has the awning that says over and over again in big bold letters 432 Park Avenue, when this photograph was taken, the photographer was actually standing on East 57th Street because 432 Park Avenue is not in fact on Park Avenue. It is, however, pretty close to Park Avenue. 
And if you're a developer that's selling apartments for $18 million a piece, you really, really want your customers to be able to men mention at a cocktail party or a dinner party that they just moved into Park Avenue. So this is what's known as a vanity address. For $11,000 in the city of New York, a developer can register an address, essentially invent one that makes their building seem more hip or more exclusive. This is the bane of New York City cab drivers, but is also an example of one of the multitude of issues that makes locations analytics difficult. And even worse, it makes them surprisingly difficult. Things that you think you can count on, like an address being on the street that, or a building being on the street that the address says it's on, actually aren't always true. And so this is one of the pitfalls that we need to deal with when we're looking at location analytics in the insurance space. Just to take a look at another example, this is a street view for 5800 Deer Trail Lane in uh, Titusville, Florida. And you can see very clearly the mailbox there with the house number on it. What you can't see in this picture is the actual house because it's down past this meandering lane and in fact, if we look at an overview, you can see that the house is way over there on the left in the uh, blue box, and the mailbox is all the way over on the right-hand side of the screen, connected to this very kind of bizarre gerrymandered lot. You couldn't actually build a new lot like this. Zoning laws in almost every community would stop you from doing that. But there are a lot of these odd, irregular parcels uh, grandfathered in. And where this becomes very relevant for insurance is if we overlay the wildfire risk of this area onto this picture. Because what we can see is if you think the building is at the street where you would normally expect it to be uh, and where a lot of uh, different software would tell you that building is, then you would think that it's in a low fire risk area. But in fact, as we can see, the actual building on this parcel is in a high risk area. So if you were writing a policy on this property, the premium that you wanted would be very different depending on whether you were pricing the building where it actually was or where it appeared to be. And this is, again, one of those kind of pernicious issues that uh, plagues insurers. We've known this anecdotally for a long time, and everybody who's worked in geographic information systems at an insurer has some story like this. But at Pitney Bowes, we wondered, is it just stories? Are these just the tales that those wild and crazy GIS engineers talk about when they get together over drinks? Or is there an actual systemic problem here that's, that's impacting the bottom line? In order to answer that question, we needed data. So what we've put together at Pitney Bowes is a master location database of essentially all of the locations in the United States. And a location typically maps to an address, uh, but not always. There's the vanity address uh, example I mentioned a few minutes ago. There are things like gated communities and basement apartments, and in short, just a lot of noise in this data that makes it difficult to precisely identify all of the properties. You can get close, you, you, a lot of them are perfectly fine, but to get a fully comprehensive master uh, list takes a lot of cleanup. And that's what we've been doing for the last couple years, is uh, going through the data and doing that cleanup uh, on this so that we could get a uniquely identified record for every location in the country. Once we did that, then we started enriching that data. So putting in things like that wildfire risk uh, that we just talked about, other perils like crime or flood or wind or earthquake, and then other uh, information that you might want to know, like demographics, local points of interest, property attributes like the uh, type of construction of the house, the type of roof, whether or not it has a garage. So in total, We've added almost a 1,000 different fields for each one of those 187 million locations. And this is something that even a few years ago would have been almost impossible from a technical standpoint. Just the sheer volume of data to crunch was beyond uh, most capabilities. 
But with advances in Hadoop and big data in general, we, we've now been able to assemble this, and we did it primarily for the benefit of our customers and partners so they could do, go through and do their own analysis. But it also now gives us this excellent uh, data set that we can look at and uh, answer questions like the one we were just looking at. And how important is it to have precise uh, geographic information in insurance, and is that just kind of an anecdotal issue or something that is a systemic issue that the industry re really needs to address? So I'm going to spend the rest of my time today talking about one of those studies that we did. This particular study we did in the state of Florida, and as we all know, Florida is the sunshine state. It's the home of idyllic beaches and beautiful blue skies, until, of course, it's not. Uh, because Florida is also the home of the worst catastrophes <laughs> in the United States and as a result has the highest insurance premiums in the United States. And despite that, despite those premiums, there are many carriers who have found that they simply can't, can't be profitable uh, in that state and have withdrawn from it. So we thought that this was a good territory to look at to address this problem because it is uh, kind of a problem child within the industry. So to start this out, we looked at essentially all of the homes in the state of Florida, almost 7 million of them, and the methodology was that we went through and we geocoded, we located uh, all of those properties using what's technically called street interpolation. I'm not going to get into the details of that, but that is the most commonly used uh, method of geolocation in the industry, so it's the industry standard. We then went through and did that same process again using Pitney Bowes master location data, which uh, is for a number of reasons, but again, I'm not going to get into too much detail on today, tends to generate about 10 or 15% more accurate results because of additional data sets and things like that. So then we had two sets of geocodes, the industry standard versus the best of breed. And what we wanted to look at was if we went through and we priced all of those policies using an actual Florida car carrier's pricing model, what would that difference be? Would it have a material impact on the bottom line to have this greater precision? And so the first thing that we learned from that was not too surprisingly, for the substantial majority of properties, there was no change. The industry standard is actually quite good, and it either – located the properties exactly right or was close enough. So even if it was a little bit off, it wasn't enough that it would be in a different rating territory. So for 94% of the properties, they were in the same rating territory, had the same uh, pricing, regardless of which geocoding method you use. 1% of the properties were overpriced. So in that case, what we found is that uh, – the using the more accurate geocoding methodology was enough that, uh, to move the rating territory, if you will, that the actual location of this property was far enough from the uh, previously believed location that it was in a different rating territory, but that new territory was actually less expensive. So the current policies were overpriced. The homeowners were being charged more than they needed to be. And that, of course, means that 5% were less that were underpriced. So again, Using the best in breed uh, methodology for geocoding identified that they, these 5% of properties should be in a different rating territory, and that rating territory was typically closer to some peril, like a coastline, and therefore the price went up. Now, 5% is not a big percentage, obviously, but what we found is that that 5% actually represents a ticking time bomb for Florida insurers in terms of the bottom line. And let me walk through a few numbers to kind of dive into that in a minute. The first thing we found is that for those 5% that changed, the, they weren't a little bit off. They, the premium changed dramatically. On average, there was a 41% change in premium when you knew the precise location of these properties rather than the estimated location. In the state of Florida, the average homeowner's premium is about $2,000 a year, so that means 41% is over $800 of difference per year for each of these houses. We found that 25,000 properties were actually off by 100% or more, so they weren't even close in terms of the pricing, and the, the difference was really dramatic for tens of thousands 
of properties. And when we look across all properties, so not just the 5% that change, but when we look across the entire uh, universe of all those 6.7 million policies, the impact of this underpricing on that relative few was $36 per policy. So again, another way to look at that is with an average policy of about $2,000 a year, that's almost two full percentage points of combined ratio of premium leak leakage that's impacting the combined ratio just from that 5% of policies that were underpriced. And what that boils down to in aggregate is almost of a, qu a quarter of a billion dollars of underpricing risk currently in the state of California, or sorry, in the state of Florida. So this is something that might not hit people this year, it might not hit people next year, but the next time a major hurricane or some other catastrophe hits Florida, this is going to hurt the carriers there substantially in their pocketbook. So if we go back to the original question on was this just kind of an anecdotal story or is there a systemic material impact on the bottom line, the answer is an emphatic yes. There is a dramatic impact in the tune of nine figures for just a single state uh, relative to this issue. And this one study was done in Florida, but we've actually looked at others as well. So for example, we looked at 3 million auto policies in the state of Ohio, and we found similar results. Uh, again, a relatively small percent of policies changed. In that case, the perils were more like crime uh, or fire as opposed to wind or uh, tidal surge. But in general, the, the same thing held true. The one difference was that in the state of Florida, underpricing was overwhelmingly the biggest problem. There were five underpriced policies for every one that was overpriced. When we looked in Ohio at auto, it was closer to 50-50. And so some people might look at that and say, well, yeah, it kind of evens out though. I might be underpricing some policies, but I'm also overpricing some policies. And so, you know, in the end, it's a wash. And that's mathematically true, but from a business standpoint is actually a seriously bad way to look at it because this is one of those situations where simply looking at the overall average does not result in an, an optimal output. Just as two wrongs don't make a right, two problems don't make a solution. And an overpricing problem doesn't fix an underpricing problem. It simply hides it. It masks that issue. And so what will happen is if your competitors get better information, if they have more precise uh, location analytics and they are able to price their policies more accurately, more accurately, those half of the overpriced policies, you're going to lose that business. All of those new quotes, you're going to be overpriced relative to the competition that understands the risk better, and they're going to take that business from you. At the same time, however, they will concede the, the policies where you're underpricing because those are going to be unprofitable in the long run. So they will let you have those, and that puts you into an adverse selection cycle where over time your book is going to become more and more full of these uh, high-risk, unprofitable policies. And the really insidious thing is you, that you won't even realize that as it's happening. It will only be over the successive years as the claims paid out that you've realized the, that your competitors have gotten a leg up on you because they've had better analytics than you did. So this is one of those situations where thinking about the average yields below average results. So just to sum this up now, even a few years ago, analysis like the ones I just talked about would have been virtually impossible. But with the recent advances in big data and the volumes of things that we can put together so that we can create this single view of risk, this ability to look at any risk for any location at any time, that now has opened up the opportunities for new analytics that we simply couldn't do before. And what we find is that even small changes, things that affect only a few percentage of our policies, can have a big impact on the bottom line. If 
insurance was running at a 30 or 40 percent profit margin, this really wouldn't be a big deal. But we all know that's not the case. This is a very mature market. There are insurance companies still operating today that Benjamin Franklin founded. And it's also a very sophisticated market. So there are not a huge difference between the top performers and the rest of the pack. What does separate the top performers is the ability to make these small tweaks at the margins that can squeeze out one or two percentage points of combined ratio. Because the math simply works out that if you're running at a 95% combined ratio, if you can drop that by two percentage points, you've increased your net income by 40%. So it's those small marginal tweaks that really flow through to have a big impact on bottom line because of the narrow margins that we're working with in the, this industry. And the key to making those tweaks in a very mature industry is to capitalize on the analytic possibilities that we now have given smart algorithms and big data and things like that to find those levers that you can pull. And so on that note, I'm going to hand it over to Liz Fisk with LTA to talk a little bit more about the analytic opportunities. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. That was a great overview of how using precision location data can yield big returns. And you hit the nail on the head. We can get even greater returns by leveraging quality data and smart or what I'll call predictive algorithms together. The term predictive analytics has become fairly ubiquitous you see it everywhere, and it seems like its definition is different depending on who you are talking to, or even sometimes it feels like what day of the week it is. Uh, so to level set and make sure we have a common understanding for the rest of our time together, my take on predictive analytics is this. We use a variety of techniques, so that can include statistics, data mining, text mining, machine learning, to analyze a large variety, and sometimes large volumes of data that can be structured or unstructured to discover new patterns and relationships that can be used to predict future events and to identify both opportunities as well as risks. So it's all about shifting from reactive to proactive data-driven decision making. So what does this look like in the insurance industry? We worked on a variety of applications for predictive analytics and insurance, and we tend to see three primary areas of interest. The first is being able to acquire, grow, and retain high value customers and provide them with responsive customer service. Secondly, developing new business models by pulling together data from across the enterprise and augmenting it with external sources to create new products and offerings. And this is to stay competitive as well as to gain more market share. And finally, we want to be able to forecast risk and detect fraud so that we can mitigate our exposure. So keeping on theme with our topic today, I will focus on this last industry, industry trend, being able to gain a single view of risk by leveraging data and predictive analytics together. There are so many questions around risk that we could tackle through a predictive analytics lens. Some of the ones that we hear most frequently have to do with identifying the risk for individual applicants, and adjusting premiums accordingly. Uh, so can we get an actual prediction for level of risk? And then can we bake in some rules to optimize how we determine pricing? Also being able to detect fraudulent claims. Can we find patterns within suspect claims? And is there a relationship with outside events like natural disasters, crime, social and political events? And on top of that, you can layer location to get a geographic view of risk. And finally, building out a workflow or, or augment, augmenting an existing workflow to streamline how applications are processed so we can maximize efficiency and profitability. To address these questions, we take an approach that combines data and analytics to provide actionable insight that can result in real business outcomes. First, we create the single view of risk by bringing together a variety of data, both internal and external. We saw how critical location data can be, and we can combine that with customer and agent data, including call notes during both underwriting process and then claims processing as well. Uh, and we can also include weather, crime, and other event data. 
Next, we apply sophisticated algorithms to the combined data to do forecasting, scenario analysis, including Monte Carlo simulation. We build out predictive models that can classify risk and give you a propensity or a confidence score associated with the prediction. We can do segmentation to understand groups within your customer base or even location-based char characteristics. We can mine unstructured text. I mentioned case notes as an example where we can look to extract insight into possible fraud or from a subrogation standpoint, uh, areas where we might be able to recover money. And finally, we can leverage newly developed algorithms and machine learning to stay on the forefront of technological applications. I really can't stress enough the notion of actionable insight. All of the predictive methods I just mentioned are intended to yield information that can be acted upon. A model is not useful unless someone actually acts on the results to make a decision. If we are prepared to act on that information, then we can expect some business value as a result. By improving accuracy and efficiency in managing risk and detecting fraud, we can avoid unnecessary risk. And ultimately, this can reduce costs. And to Mike's earlier point, we can also increase our potential revenue. Before I hand it back to Betty to wrap things up, I would like to answer a few questions that have come in through our chat window. All right. So the first question, I have questions I want to address with predictive analytics that are specific to my business. How unique are your models to each of your clients? Good question. Uh, we've seen some common areas where insurance companies want to apply predictive analytics, but you make a great point that every business is different. We work with you to understand your specific requirements and then build out a solution that meets your specific needs. From a model perspective, our typical approach is to use a client's historical data as our foundation, and then we augment that with external data sources, uh, and then we build out a model that's specific or unique to that business. Okay. Next question, how do you deal with new data or improving predictive results over time? Also a great question. Uh, we see the availability of new data sources and new modeling techniques all the time. It's constantly shifting and changing. The approach we use is based on an iterative methodology. So it's almost purpose built to accommodate new data and to revisit results dynamically so they can be improved. I always recommend working on a plan for refreshing or updating predictive models. Um, there's no real rule of thumb here in terms of how often. It really does depend on the business question that we're trying to address, constraints within the business and, and data-wise as well. So we'd work with you to figure those out. Um, so this could be driven by, as I said, business requirements, or we can set it up to become automated. Another question. Can your solution help me understand the drivers of predictions? Great point. While getting to the actual prediction is usually our end goal, ultimately, uh, it's also just as important to be able to understand how we arrived at that prediction. So we typically do dig into the models we build to understand key drivers. Um, sometimes it's a root cause analysis. Sometimes it's just deconstructing uh, the model rules or results that are generated. Um, and it's a good way to confirm patterns we're seeing. Uh, sometimes we call it a reality check just to make sure what we're seeing. Um, we can validate, go back to the business, and, and confirm what we're seeing. Uh, and oftentimes, that higher level understanding of the key drivers can inform your business processes. Thank you. Those were great questions. Um, if I didn't answer your question, don't worry. I will follow up directly with you to make sure we get you answers. Thank you, and Betty, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you for that perspective on this new and emerging field, Mike and Liz. Insurance companies are creating entirely new business offerings by merging data sets with location intelligence and advanced analytics capabilities. So where do you start? We're often asked this question, and analytics can feel very daunting to our clients, but after hundreds of successful engagements, these are the quickest ways to get started. You can decide what's best for you, and any of these can be a great starting point. We can perform a health check or readiness assessment of your current environment to pinpoint the quick hits for an analytics implementation. 
You can start small. I always say don't boil the ocean. Install analytics software with just a few users and take advantage of a proof of concept. You can develop a business case with an ROI to quantify how analytics will improve your business because having the right metrics going into a project can help ensure that the goals are met and exceeded and we can assist you with this. And lastly, engage your executive team and C-suite team and participate in a half day or a full day strategic roadmap on analytics. We are working with several clients right now, helping them bring new products and services to market by leveraging the power of analytics. I hope you've enjoyed our webinar today and please do join us for future webinars by going to our website at lpa.com and selecting webinar series. Thank you and have a great day.